Albert Bourla is the CEO of Pfizer. Under his leadership, the biotech giant has been at the forefront of battling the coronavirus pandemic. It delivered the first ever COVID-19 vaccine shots in December 2020, a landmark achievement in medicine Bourla called a great day for humanity. Today, Pfizer has delivered hundreds of millions of COVID vaccine shots globally. So Albert, welcome to the event. Thank you again for joining us. I'm, I'm so excited to talk about really so many things today, but let's start off with obviously the thing that's on everyone's mind, which is the kids vaccine for five to 11. We're a day away from hearing uh, from the FDA panel. And I wanna just talk a little bit about what you're doing to prepare, you know, if you get that green light, are you ready to go? And, and how quickly will we get to see these shots in arms? Yes, first of all, it's a great pleasure to be with you, Anzali, and uh, thank you for the invitation. We are working uh, as uh, before uh, at risk. So in parallel, we prepared uh, the new formulations, and uh, if uh, we get a positive uh, opinion and then approval from FDA, uh, we will be, and then later from CDC, we will be ready to circulate immediately the new formulation for uh, these uh, kids. Is it different from what we saw happen with adult vaccines? Are there different sort of avenues or, or distribution channels that you need to focus on? It's a different formulation. This is one third of the mRNA. The injection uh, contains then the mRNA that we're giving to, to the adults. And uh, so that's why we, we require to, to, to make it in a very different way. Got it. OK, well, that's good to know. I'll definitely be keeping track of that. Um, when we talk about what else is going on, you know, the vaccine is obviously front and center and we're going to get to more later. But I just want to stay on the vaccine for a few minutes and talk about what's going on globally, because that seems to be really something that you have to contend with uh, these days. Uh, Initially, you know, last year, this time last year, when we were talking about what the vaccine race looked like, no vaccines had been authorized. You expected a lot more competition, quite frankly, on the world stage. And now you find yourself in a very different position with a lot more pressure to develop as well as distribute vaccine doses. Tell me a little bit about, uh, you know, like what that has been like to, to see that and how that has changed your global strategy. Well, it was very, very true what you just said, that uh, not only there were a lot of uh, potential vaccines that uh, would make it, but um, also we were, for a lot of countries, were not the preferred one because uh, uh, we didn't promise local manufacturing. Uh, there were other um, companies that uh, they signed contracts offering that we would do it in Brazil, we would do it in South Africa. Um, we didn't do that. We said we are going to do it in our manufacturing sites, wherever they are ready. Uh, to do it right now. And also mRNA was not a proven technology. So as a result, we received not many orders from uh, countries other than the highly developed uh, income countries, the Europe, uh, the, the US and Japan, Canada, they were the countries that they had placed the orders. That I didn't like at all. And I actually sent letters to heads of states at the time of uh, low and middle income countries, telling them that everything that we have scheduled to produce will be allocated pretty soon. And if I urge them to place an order so that uh, we can, uh, let's say, reserve quantities for them, uh, they didn't. And uh, for their reasons, it's not that uh, but nobody knew at that time. Of course, the situation changed when uh, our vaccine became so effective and so safe, and then um, other vaccines either didn't make it or they were not able to produce at scale. So everybody wanted to get from us. And we changed dramatically our strategy. We had invested to uh, produce 1.3 billion doses for 2021. When we realized the situation, we put way more investments into the system and we were able to raise the, the volumes to 3 billion doses this year and 4 billion next year. The 40, more than 40% actually of these quantities uh, will uh, go to middle and low income countries by the end of the year, not in uh, next year, in, in two months. That will be the total. Right. And uh, so right now it is very disproportionate. We are shipping way more to low and middle income countries uh, than to high income countries, which is the opposite of what we did the first six months. 
I'm going to turn philosophical here. Would it have been different if you had, instead of pursuing, I mean, of course, hindsight is 2020, but knowing what you know now, would it have been better to maybe work through COVAX more, uh, more intently rather than uh, these bilateral agreements? Or have those worked out better in terms of keeping control over the, the manufacturing process? No, we did work with, with COVAX. And again, with COVAX, it was the same situation. COVAX, they placed more of their bets in AstraZeneca. And uh, they were uh, they placed very few orders in the beginning with our vaccine for many different reasons. And then eventually things didn't work and they came back to us asking us for way more quantities. What we did was even something better. We, we had a tier price in our vaccine, which means that uh, high income countries were getting the vaccine at uh, the cost of a takeaway meal. You all know it's 20, 25 bucks. This is the, the price for a vaccine. But for middle income countries, we are charging half of this cost to the government because they give it free to the citizens. Right. And for the low-income countries, we are charging at cost, non for profit. What we did, we signed with the US government an agreement that we are providing them 1 billion doses. I repeat, 1 billion doses at cost. Ourselves, we are not making profit. Then the US government takes those doses and they give it for free to the low-income countries. The only agreement that we made with them was that these doses, one billion, is to go to the poorest of the countries. The way that we administer, we administer through COVAX, the US government. And of course, we are working on the logistics. So eventually, COVAX is getting a lot of doses from us. Right. And, and that's what's happening now, of course. Through other countries, though, is that possible? I know I've seen some reports where other countries might want to do the same, but they claim that their contract restricts them from doing that. Can you clarify what's going on there? No, no, no. It's. Uh... We, we have uh, we have all countries that they ask us to donate doses somewhere else. We collaborated with them, and within two three days we gave them the approval to do it. There is no way that we will leave doses in a country that they are not utilized when they could go to a country that can be utilized. Definitely. And what about the South Africa? I was really, uh, really intrigued by the partnership you've created with BioVac Institute down in South Africa. Um, I know that it was supposed to be operational by early next year. Can you give us an update on the timeline on when we might actually see doses manufactured there? I think the timeline that we announced is the timeline that we will uh, will stick to. The, um, the, the company that you are partnering with in, in South Africa is a company that we know very well. We are already producing over there other vaccines. That is what enabled us to have, let's say, the, the confidence that uh, they can uh, do uh, the manufacturing with the high levels of uh, quality because we are working with them uh, for, for a long time. So we will stick to the schedule and uh, they will start manufacturing. And also the agreement is that all doses that will be manufactured in Africa will stay in Africa. Of course, Africa will receive way more doses from doses that are manufactured in other places, namely Europe and the US. Well, that's good. Yeah, that's that's great to hear. And obviously, that confidence build, uh, plays a role in why you wouldn't be able to say, just broadly speaking, you know, create more of these partnerships or or even going back to the IP argument. I've I've heard your stance on that. You know, that it's not feasible and that it would create sort of unnecessary competition as well for raw material raw materials per se. But is there maybe a chance to have uh, done what maybe Gilead did initially, where it was voluntary licenses? And and if you have that much confidence that they really can't start from scratch, maybe just do it as a goodwill gesture even to, to say, okay, here it is. Yeah. I think that Moderna did it. Uh, they waived their rights to intellectual property uh, so that anybody could do it for the low income companies. Nobody did. That demonstrates that <laughs> what we were saying is true, that uh, they won't be able to do it just by out license. These are technologies unlike the ones that, uh, for example, Gilead or antibodies, where they had been produced massively in the world before. And the mRNA was never produced anywhere in the world. It was the first time that we produced. The machinery that we used to produce the mRNA was designed by us. And then we asked manufacturers to manufacture the machines that we are using in our manufacturing plant. So it would be impossible, as it was, to, to do someone to scale up uh, within let's say, a reasonable amount of time, less than two years, for example. Right. 
Okay. Moving on to the uh, the pill, that's obviously something that's really exciting and coming down the line, something that's very needed, especially for considering this virus to be, you know, with us for quite some time and to help with treatments. How quickly do you think we can get that really to the world? Because obviously you don't want to be in a similar situation as the vaccine. So have you thought about the distribution process there? Yeah. First of all, what is right now at stake is to make sure that we have one uh, or antiviral. Um, we are uh, running the studies, and uh, I hope we'll be positive. I have a lot of reasons to be optimistic, but um, in my career, I have seen science disappointing us a lot as well. So I have seen projects that we thought will give us a medicine, but eventually they failed. So I keep my fingers crossed uh, and that the studies will be positive, and I hope that we will be able to know if the studies are positive before the end of the year. So that's one. Uh, I have authorized uh, just uh, uh, three months ago um, an, a, a bit over a billion dollar of at risk investment in manufacturing, which means that we already started uh, ordering raw materials, cleaning uh, new lines, clearing new lines, manufacturing lines, building equipment that is needed uh, to manufacture that without knowing if it is uh, going to be successful or not. That we did because we know that time is of essence. And if it is successful, we should be able to produce as quickly as possible. And again, we are asking uh, governments to, to, to place orders uh, with us. And uh, we will do the same. So if someone comes from a low-income country to place an order, we will honor this order. And we will Absolutely. give an allocation. Uh, but they need to come. To, to place orders. If they don't, we can't do it. Well, sure. I'm, I'm sure they're going to hear your message now, loud and clear. Um, I want to well, move I, I away from. I have told from... them multiple <laughs> times, but uh, I, I have told them multiple times the vaccine, and I have told them multiple times with this one. And uh, not everybody uh, is uh, thinking that right. Is willing, yeah. Well, let's talk about j just what this pandemic has really done for you. When right before it started, you were still relatively new in the role and had taken over and talked a lot about a shift in how Pfizer operates. You've shown your appetite for risk with pursuing mRNA for this vaccine. How has that shaped your thinking about how really to uh, address the rest of the pipeline? I think it was uh, transformational in our culture and in our thinking. Keep in mind that we have uh, one of the six business units that did the COVID vaccine, the vaccines business unit. So and during that time, the other five business units in Pfizer uh, were watching vaccines becoming the saviors of the world. And guess what? They want also to have their own uh, COVID moment. They want also to have their own project in oncology and develop very quickly something that has transformational capacity for human uh, health. They say the same they do in uh, internal medicine or in cardiovascular disease on multiple other therapeutic areas. So I think the biggest transformation for us, it is this cultural uh, transformation of people that think that nothing is really impossible. That if you aim very, very high, you can always think out of the box and find solutions to things that you never thought that uh, will be solvable. And this is the... Uh, uh, the, the big heritage that uh, the COVID uh, vaccine leaves us to be able to repeat that in cancer, in uh, rare diseases, in uh, immune responses, in everything. And one of those things, thinking outside the box, is the warranty program you created for one of your lung cancer treatments. Tell me a little bit about what you hope to achieve with this. And, and may, are we going to be able to see this apply to maybe some other products? Hopefully, we are. Um, this is a, a project that tries to um, guarantee the performance. It's based on the value. There is a price that uh, the healthcare system needs to pay, and also there is a, a participation of the patient that they need to pay for this drug. And uh, there are some expectations uh, about the performance of, of the drug based on the clinical trials. So in uh, in a demonstration of partnership, what we did with the payers was that uh, uh, the patients pay for, for the medicine and the, the system, but uh, if the medicine does not deliver the expected benefit in particular patients, we pay back both the money that the system pays to us, the insurance company, and the money that uh, the patient paid us 
in terms of copay. Um, I hope that we will be uh, will see that that project will be successful, and we would like very much to implement it into other areas as well. Okay. Well, one final question for you. Obviously, drug pricing is on everyone's minds, and I've heard some of your responses to, broadly speaking, the topic. But I wonder, on the specific point of drug of price increases, annual or regular increases, uh, do you think that there needs to be some sort of curbing or some sort of uh, regulatory oversight into how quickly and how much uh, prices increase? You know, the, 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 the issue of uh, drug pricing is a real issue in the U.S., but it is not the issue that some people think and present. This, the total cost of medicines to the healthcare system represents 12%. This is how much the employer, this is how much Medicare pays to us in terms of, of uh, how much it pays to hospitals, physicians, everybody else. So by definition, this cannot be the big problem when you are 12%. And by the way, it's going down, not up. For example, in the first six months, Pfizer reported minus 5% in net pricing of uh, U.S. medicines in the U.S. business. And it was uh, minus also the years before. So that's not the problem. But I'm sure that our patients, the patients that are taking our medicines, didn't experience this minus 5%. Experienced 2, 3, 5, 10, 20% sometimes increases in how much they have to pay, what is their participation for the cost of the medicine, because the two are not uh, connected. We have a problem here. The Americans are paying for their medicines like if they don't have insurance, although they do have insurance, and this needs to change. This needs to make sure that it will not be the case moving forward. I'm sure that if they have to pay less, that will be a cost, and the system will have to absorb a cost. Who is paying for that cost? I'm willing. We are willing, the farming industry, to participate and pay our fair share, pay even more than our fair share, as long as everything that we provide goes to release patients from the out of pocket. Where we disagree, it is policies that uh, will take all the money from the pharmaceutical industry and move them to the black hole of the federal budget to do other things. This is not the issue right now. The issue is the out of pocket of patients, which is very, very high. That's what we need to address. If there are other projects that also are much needed, like the infrastructure project, I agree that everybody should contribute based on some rationale, but not necessarily that we target the pharma industry to fix the infrastructure. We should target corporate America. We should target everyone who can contribute so that we can resolve the infrastructure. Everything that the pharma industry is giving extra on top of that needs to go to release the out of pocket of the patients it needs to make medicines right. affordable definitely well i wish that you and i could solve that problem together here but unfortunately we're out Why of don't time you try it? Um, <laughs> <laughs> we should have next time albert borla <laughs> ceo of pfizer thank you again for joining us today pleasure and hope to have you back soon thank you very much pleasure